Welcome back. Former Deputy President Dr. Pumzilim Lambonuka has described South Africa's foreign policy as fuzzy right now and called for greater government engagement with civil society and human rights activists. She was speaking to SABC News on the sidelines of the Global Citizen Now Summit in New York that focuses on tackling poverty and climate change, among other SDGs. She called on the government to use its proximity to Russia to call for the cessation of hostilities in Ukraine and to put pressure on Moscow to come to the peace table. She also talked about her recent visit to Ethiopia, women's rights in Afghanistan, and the broader implementation of the Sustainable Development Agenda. Dr. Pumzile M. Lambongluka, as always, thank you for making time for SABC News. Thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to be back in New York. You've come straight to New York from a visit to Ethiopia, where, of course, you played a very key mediation role in the peace deal struck in Pretoria last November. What did you find in Ethiopia, and what messages do you bring to this summit in New York? A lot of progress has been made in the implementation of the peace deal. Certainly, cessation of hostilities, which was a priority, and silencing of the guns. Uh, we still may have uh, sporadic skirmishes and people dying, but nothing like what was there before. The withdrawal of the foreign forces, Eritrea in particular, and uh, the moving away of heavy artillery, which uh, was uh, dangerous, the restoration of services uh, like uh, telecommunications, banking, right. uh, not to the full extent. We still need to see more progress there. We also need to see more progress in the opening of the schools because we have many IDPs who are taking hostage in the schools who are afraid to go back to their homes because the evacuation of uh, foreign forces has not been completed, but so we're pushing to complete that process. Pros, uh, pr uh, the implementation of any peace deal will always take time. And while you, you focused on that, you now see what's happening in Sudan, two male generals at each other's throats, uh, creating additional uh, instability in what is already a very fragile region in Africa. And of course, this also speaks to, you know, the AU's ambition of silencing the guns come 2030. That is seeming to be further and further away, given what we're seeing uh, happening mm. in Sudan now. Yeah, just uh, uh, important to say that uh, I'm still worried in Ethiopia about the engagement of women in the peace process. This is something we still have to to work towards and of course we as you say we have uh, Sudan um, as well uh, it is a difficult neighborhood uh, that's for sure and the fact that uh, the fighting in Sudan as well is internal it's uh, two forces fighting within the same countries living very little space for for people to find uh, safety. Uh, the AU does need all the help it can get for a ceasefire, for ensuring that uh, the two generals realize that uh, the the fighting that uh, they have started there is actually alienating them and their leadership from the people they want to, to, to rule over. So we're looking forward to see who the African Union will send to, to Sudan to facilitate peace. I know that uh, in South Africa, they have uh, uh, sent uh, or identified the deputy president as, a, as an envoy who will assist mm -hmm in bringing about peace. Are there any immediate lessons that, you know, every situation is different, obviously, but are there any immediate lessons that one can learn from the process in Ethiopia that might be able to be applied in Sudan? Yeah. My biggest takeaway is that if the two fighting parties uh, have not reached a point where the fighting does not serve their interest, it is difficult to stop them. In Ethiopia, the TPLF 
and the government wanted the fight to stop. Right. Because on the part of TPLF, the dying of civilians, children, women, and all the suffering that was happening there had just reached a point where it was unbearable. On the side of government, the decline and disruption in the economy was very difficult and was causing a lot of hardships, as well as uh, the loss of life on the part of the soldiers of uh, uh, the Ethiopian um, army. So on both sides, uh, there was something that they wanted to sort out and they were able to come together to the negotiating table. Both of them uh, really committed to get a cessation of hostilities. Of course, when we talk about the eradication of poverty, one cannot ignore the proliferation of guns and conflicts around the world, no less uh, with the global implications that have been wrought by the war in Ukraine. What have you made of South Africa's neutral position in terms of uh, the war and, and its subsequent position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, arrest warrant issued by the International Criminal Court? I think it's important to continue to call for cessation of facilities in, in Ukraine. Any more fighting uh, in Ukraine is not only horrible for the people of Ukraine and the region, it is a problem for so many other people um, in the world. So one of the best things uh, that South Africa can do is to use its proximity to Russia, to put pressure on Russia to actually come to the peace table. There is growing concern about South Africa's foreign policy positions. Under the uh, administration of uh, former President Nelson Mandela, an, an administration that you were part of, uh, human rights was at the center of South Africa's foreign policy. There is concern that that is no longer the case. What's your, what's your view? I think we need uh, actors such as civil society, human rights activists to actually engage government uh, about the focus of South Africa's foreign policy so that we can all recognize the strings of foreign policy uh, key points in whatever they are doing it in whatever country that they are doing. It's a bit fuzzy uh, mm -hmm. right now and it's important to have clarity. Does South Africa require additional clarity on its international obligations as it pertains to its membership of the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court? Is there a debate to be had about what South Africa should do if an indicted person of the ICC sets foot in the country? Well, uh, we have South African government and we have the party. And sometimes the two don't want the same thing. And that is the challenge that we have. There has to be an effort to make sure that uh, the, 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 what the party stands for and what the government stands for are aligned. I think right now there are challenges as far as that is concerned. You might be heartened by the resolution that was passed in the UN Security Council yesterday on con condemning the Taliban's position as it relates to women in Afghanistan, particularly women working for the United Nations, for NGOs, and of course the ability of women to mm. go to school and to uh, get a tertiary education. What do you make of that resolution? And you know, the difficulty always comes down to implementation. We've seen this before. How concerned are you that this is a another resolution that might just be ignored? Well. Uh, the situation if in Afghanistan is atrocious. Uh, there definitely is a need for everyone to continue to, to continue calling for peace. And the United Nations is an important voice, so it's important to listen to the voice. Global Citizen has supported uh, the UN's call uh, for peace and I think will continue to, 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 to do so. But we actually need also to support the United Nations with the implementation of these many resolutions that are being passed. I think it is going to be difficult because access to Afghanistan is itself um, a difficulty. To work in Afghanistan, to move around, continues 
uh, to, 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 to be a problem. And of course, two-thirds of that population isn't reliant on humanitarian no, relief. And absolutely. women have to be a key peg of that, yeah, not so. Yeah, and we need uh, foreign governments to stay in Afghanistan and not abandon uh, Afghanistan in order for any change uh, to happen. Uh, we require people who believe in the affirmation of, of women and the empowerment of women and the, and the involvement of women to be on the spot. Mm. This is not something we can do from outside. One of the core issues of Global Citizen is, of course, the eradication of poverty and, of course, a very big focus on climate change and mitigation in that regard. But the big concern in terms of the SDG agenda is, of course, the lack of implementation as the 2030 uh, agenda looms on us. The, uh, the, the, this summit has now launched a Power Our Planet Act Today, uh, Save Tomorrow campaign. What do you make of this initiative as it feeds into the broader uh, international agenda around the SDGs? Well, it's, it's important to send messages, especially to young people, because honestly, I think young people are the ones that are going to help us to move forward. So a call from global citizen, which we lend on young people is important, but I think we also need to, as global citizen, to follow up mm -hmm. with those young people and give them the means, the capacity for them to make the follow through impactful. The, the, large, the, the young people have got numbers, uh, so you are able to implement in many parts uh, of the world. And this is about their future. If we are not uh, able to do something about the climate crisis now, right. we are leaving these young people in a terrible situation. I was in the plenary earlier and there was a bit of a discussion around artificial intelligence and of course I, I recently interviewed uh, Professor uh, Ch Chiditsi uh, Marwala, mm. the new mm. rector of the UN University and he talked about how digital literacy needs to become a human right. Mm. What is the role, you talk about young people, the role of technology, young people in uh, this ambitious agenda that is the SDGs? Yeah, well, this is now the work that I do, this is my everyday bread. Uh, and I see in schools uh, in South Africa the challenge of young people and teachers who are digitally illiterate. Uh, it's a big problem. It's, it is a big problem. Women who are digitally illiterate, who were obviously left out in the first industrial revolution, second industrial, third, the fourth industrial revolution is critical. We cannot leave women, young people, poor people, because this is now the language of the future. If you don't speak the language, you will not hear what everybody is saying about you. And it will impact you in the most negative way if you are unable to be part of the conversation. So this is a, this is a priority work. In our work at um, Umlambo Foundation, we find that once the teachers get it and they are able to see the need to transmit these skills and capabilities to, to, to the learners, their anxiety, mm -hmm. you know, they want gadgets, they want infrastructure. And it's good once you reach that point because at least you are both working for the same goal. Dr. Pumzile Mlamongluka, as always, thank you for sharing your perspectives with us. We certainly do appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much.